Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're gonna look at a video that I made a couple of years ago about perhaps the most significant encounter in 20th century philosophy. And I'm quite dissatisfied with this video because first of all, I did not explain why this encounter is so important. And secondly, I was clearly only familiarized with one of the two thinkers and was sympathizing heavily with the way in which he wanted to frame the whole encounter. So today I'm gonna try to do better and hopefully provide a fun and approachable introduction to the controversy surrounding Rudolf Carnap and Martin Heidegger. So without further ado, let's do this. Oof, is it 12 already? Today we're gonna talk about nothing. Not like nothing, nothing, but nothing, nothing. You know, the nothing that nothings. So yeah, already this video comes from the standpoint of, wow, look, there's some people that do really weird things to language. Why are they doing weird things to language? They should probably stop doing weird things to language. But the point of this video should be to explain why they are doing that and what are they are trying to achieve. In 1932, Carnap wrote a paper in which he attacked Heidegger's philosophy as being a bunch of nonsense. Usually, philosophers attack metaphysical claims as being, at best, uncertain because they reach beyond human perceptions. Carnap didn't want to say that they are false. He wanted to say that they are not even false. They are just nonsense. They have, they are meaningless. It's nothing. It's crazy talk. Pseudo statements, as he called them, empty phrases that break logical syntax. So essentially, Carnap's attack will be that Heidegger is not even uh, wrong when he's talking about, well, anything. Uh, he is not even wrong. He is not even in the field in which truth and falsehood would battle. He is somewhere completely else. And as such, uh, any sound philosopher should just disregard him as a poet or an artist who is clearly not in the same realm as a philosopher who is trying to uh, speak or derive at the truth. Okay, to just briefly explain the significance of this uh, encounter, in a nutshell, it exemplifies a divide in the way in which 20th century philosophy has been done. On the one side, you have thinkers such as uh, Russell, Frege, uh, Rudolf Carnap, Quine, Putnam, Kripke, who above anything else uh, value the notion of clarity and their method of uh, logical analysis or rather presenting your uh, line of thought as a clearly structured uh, logical argument. And then on the other hand, you have thinkers such as Heidegger, Deleuze, Foucault, Sartre, who find these methods quite limiting in the way that they well, set up which topics are valid for research and which ones are not. So they are trying to find some alternative ways in which they articulate some of the questions concerning existence and so on. So this encounter has been named the analytic continental divide and it is exemplified in the way in which Carnap reacted to the works of Martin Heidegger. The work, um, not the work, but the goal of a contemporary philosopher should be to bridge this divide because now we have a bunch of well, well established thinkers that are essentially dealing with the same questions, the same topics but they simply refuse to listen to each other because their style of writing and methods differ. But probably, I mean, it's not hard to see how both sides would profit uh, massively if they would just listen to each other and incorporate the ideas and critiques of the other side. So this divide is far from clear cut and it has been even contested whether it even makes sense to talk about it in such a way, but clearly, we can see that there are different thinkers that do things differently and refuse to listen to each other. And one such example, one striking example, is the way in which Carnap tried to disprove Heidegger while at the same time refusing to truly listen to what Heidegger 
tried to say and wanted to do with his philosophy. Luckily, I prepared some rare footage of Heidegger's inaugural speech. Das nichts wird preisgegeben in der Wissenschaft. Aber gibt die Wissenschaft den Seienden nichts damit nicht zu? Wow. Wow. Yeah, and then I did this. I dramatized the whole encounter between the two thinkers, uh, which I'm not gonna show today. Uh, but let's just say it is a place where I could show off the fact that I speak German. Maybe the... Yeah, I don't get to do that often, so that was nice. Uh, yeah. I mean, you can say things like the rain rains, okay, but nothing, nothings. I mean, when Karnov heard that, he was like, what? Like, his head was having a... You know, his bullshit receptors went like, you know... Okay, so what about this nothing, nothings? Uh, this is a sentence that Heidegger uses in his lecture, the one that Carnap is responding to, and Carnap is gonna try to show that this uh, sentence is clearly like impossible to be translated into any conceivable logical system, and if such, then clearly it must be nonsense. Uh, Carnap is not willing to consider what Heidegger is even trying to get at here. Uh, so maybe I should explain what he is trying to get at here. Uh, Heidegger uh, says in the same lecture that science using logics is interested in the world and nothing else. But what about this nothing, he asks. And maybe at this point thinkers such as Karnam will be like, oh, what the hell, man, stuff, what? Uh, but maybe some other ones will be willing to consider where this is going. And uh, essentially, this is going in the direction of, well, considering the fact that there are some questions about human existence, questions pertaining to ethics and uh, the meaning of life, for example, uh, that many thinkers, such as Carnap and, uh, as we saw in previous videos, Ludwig Wittgenstein, take to be uh, well, uh, something that stemmed from a philosophical confusion, some confused feelings and angst about the world, but surely uh, it is not a valid philosophical question that we could be answering. Uh, but Heidegger would say that, yeah, well, if science and logic, they say that we cannot talk about the meaning of life, well, all the words for science and logics then we will do something else. We will find a different way in which to arrive at those questions and answer them. And this is essentially uh, what Heidegger is hinting at here. Uh, we should just abolish even logics, even say things like the nothing nothings, which is clearly a provocation. Uh, we should uh, go to that realm of a poet, even if it has to be, if that's the way in which to arrive at answers pertaining to the meaning of life, for example. Not to do too much injustice to Karnap, who was way more aware of what Heidegger was trying to do than he makes it seem in this uh, well, attack uh, on his philosophy. Um, he was aware of the general project and he would just say that, yeah, maybe this, generally speaking, has some appeal to some maybe more artistically inclined uh, philosophers, uh, but clearly other under like real philosophical scrutiny, this would just fall apart. And now he will demonstrate how uh, the nonsense that uh, Heidegger is uh, well incorporating into his philosophy is like actual true nonsense, and it cannot contribute to philosophical development in any way. Karnap invites us to think of a person that introduces us to a new word called Tuvi. He contends that there are some things that are Tuvi and that there are some things that are not Tuvi. So we would probably ask that person to define what makes a thing Tuvi. And ultimately we would like that person to point to a visible feature of a thing that makes it Tuvi. Let's say that gradually we can make out that the person means chair with the word tui. Now, Karnap would just say, okay, so tui is synonymous to chair. That's it. 
But if the person would contend that no, 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 actually I mean something else with Tuli, it's something deeper, you know, then Karna would be just like, oh, bitch, I don't care about your private association, it means chat! <laughs> so here Karna points to some elementary examples of how language functions in order to show how it also does not function. Uh, we can imagine a person uh, using a word Tuli, and now we would ask him, okay, what does that mean? And if we are to understand the word, we should probably know when this word applies, like when I would use it, in what situation and in what context and so on. And if the person is unable to tell us that, then we cannot possibly understand the word. What he could also do is to well, show us by continuously using the word. Uh, and then we could gradually make out in what context it is being used and then we would slowly get it. And Karnam goes on to say that whoever introduces us to the word too, we should also point to some uh, visible features of the word so that we truly get what part of the word this word is referring to. Now this is a very uh, empiricist way of looking at language uh, because this is ultimately uh, Karnam's demise. The idea that language merely points to uh, empirical facts in the world, whatever we can observe. But clearly language refers to a bunch of things that are merely conceptual and are not out there in the world. This is maybe in this context a minor detail, but it is ultimately what led to the demise of logical empiricism, the school of thought which Carnap helped establish and was part of. Carnap basically wanted all of our words to be... What? What? Meme break! Okay, I completely forgot about that, but I did a whole sequence about me watching and commenting memes about Carnap and Heidegger in the midst of that video. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna react to that here, but uh, if you wanna check it out, the link to the original video is in the description. Uh, but yeah, let's go on. Now, Karna basically wanted all of our words to be traceable back to immediate perception of the world. Now, remember last time we talked about Ludwig Wittgenstein and how he imagined ideal language to be analyzable to the simplest elements of reality? Now, Karnav wanted language to be analyzable to the simplest parts of our immediate perception of the world. Yeah, so this is an interesting connection between Wittgenstein and Karnav. Wittgenstein did talk about a clear expression being one that maps the simplest elements in reality. But then this presupposes a notion of external reality, that our thoughts, our language mirrors. Uh, Karnap wanted to relativize this picture of language a little bit so that a clear expression uh, maps the simplest elements of our immediate perception into uh, a uh, whatever you want to describe. For example, the notion of chair combines uh, the elements of you know the four legs, the brown color, the shape, everything into one cluster, which is the chair. This analysis should ultimately lead us to descriptions like black, round, small, you know, the simplest elements given in our immediate perception that we can imagine. And once we would do that, uh, trace all of the words in our language to like something in our immediate perception, then we would achieve ultimate or absolute preciseness with our words and our experience of the world would be directly translatable to other people, to other people and vice versa. So yeah, this is Karnap's unique empiricist view of language, but as said, it is doomed to fail because a lot of language does not map any perceptions. It is purely conceptual, such as uh, any talk about logics and mathematics. Uh, and even philosophy, ethics, what is the good, where in my immediate perception is anything pertaining to the good. On the other side you have philosophers like Martin Heidegger who constructed sentences like nothing, nothing. Here we have the subject nothing, which okay, but the verb to nothing, that's where, you know, Karnap uses it, it's like, what? <laughs> 
Karnov simply fails to think of any way of how we could translate that into an ideal language. Philosophers should start from the epistemological certainty of immediate perception and then construct a scientifically rigid and systematic vocabulary about, around it. With it, we give the essential tools to science, which can start to investigate the world, while philosophers just root out linguistic confusion. Other than that, the job of philosophy is basically done. So, there's several things to unpack here. One of them being the notion of the end of philosophy that Carnap has clearly taken from Wittgenstein. At the time, both of them seem to be saying that uh, essentially philosophy has no role to play in humanity's uh, quest for knowledge anymore, but it should merely play a supporting role to science by scrutinizing scientific language and try to uh, help science uh, clarify the concepts that it is using. The second thing is that Carnap clearly recognizes that thinkers such as Heidegger and Nietzsche try to get at something, but they are not expressing valid thoughts, Carnap would say, they are merely expressing a general attitude towards life, the same way that a dancer might. Now, Carnap wants to exile metaphysics from philosophy, because it's not really philosophy, he thought, but they just kind of express a feeling about the world in the same way that artists do. And for example, Nietzsche became self-aware about this when he didn't pretend in his style to write a scientific matter because it's not a paper really, but it's just prose, it's art. So the funny thing here is that Karnak points to the example of Nietzsche here, uh, trying to say that yeah, Nietzsche actually kind of got aware of that fact that he's not really expressing any valid thoughts when he just abandoned the form of like a philosophical text and started writing a more uh, literature-esque type of book, like for example, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, because yeah, he got like kind of aware of the fact that yeah, I'm not really doing philosophy, I'm doing something that is closer to art, so why not, why the hell, why not write a novel? Um, yeah, that's, uh, yeah, that, that's funny to me, I don't know, that's really funny to me that Karnov would uh, suggest such a thing. Oh, okay, that's the end of the video, okay. Um, yeah, that's basically what uh, Karnov had to say about Heidegger, I guess, at least in that paper. And uh, I hope that I was able to also explain why we might be justified in having some sympathy for what Heidegger is doing as well. Uh, obviously, I only hinted at that for now, but maybe I could make a video on Heidegger in the future. But for that, maybe I would also have to read more Heidegger which, God help me, is not the most pleasant thing to do. Uh, anyways, thanks for tuning in, thanks for watching. I am back in some way, I suppose, with my YouTube videos. We will see how that goes, um, but for now, I'm here and looking forward to do some, some of them, uh, some videos. <laughs> thank you, hey, thank you uh, for all the nice comments that you guys left in the previous videos. Uh, I, I really appreciate it. Thank you.